on this edition of It's a Miracle. They say you can find just about anything you want on the internet. I was on there to make some friends and to have somebody to talk to. I wasn't looking for love on, uh, on the computer. That's not something that ever crossed my mind. But she found the man of her dreams, and he gave her something that she never expected, a miracle that would save her life. And world-famous gospel singers, the Winans, share their own emotional story of a family who come together in a time of great need. This, beyond any shadow of a doubt, is one of the greatest miracles that I have ever seen. It will lift your spirits and make your heart sing. Then, a story of young lovers who end their relationship over the phone, only to find each other again years later because of a wrong number. I think timing was everything in this because the area codes had already changed out there. If I had dialed that number, Two months later, I don't think I ever would have ran across Dana again. It's a fairy tale story that will make you believe in the destiny of true love. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle. Happening to everyday people, changing their lives forever. It's a miracle. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. I'm Nia Peoples. And I'm Richard Thomas. As we've seen again and again on this show, miracles can happen anywhere and at any time, and sometimes they can come from the least likely of sources. That's what happens in our first story. It begins after a winter storm. The ground is covered with snow, but it's not just hiding the fields and the roads, it's also hiding a very unexpected miracle. It was February 1982. A fierce snowstorm had dumped more than a foot of snow on rural Pennsylvania. Temperatures were well below freezing, and homemaker Chris Clark Davidson was concerned about her grandmother. My grandma lived out in the middle of nowhere, so we would come every couple of weeks to take her down to the grocery store and to make sure that um, everything was in order with her. Because of the weather conditions, Chris's mother, Elaine Knaus, volunteered to help care for Chris's two small children during the 100-mile ride. We've done it many times, so it was just a normal happening for us. We expected to drive over to her place, take her shopping, and then head on home. To make better time, Chris decided to take a country back road that would shave an hour off their round-trip schedule. In the summertime, it was a good shortcut. But winter road conditions were another matter, and Chris soon started having second thoughts about her decision. The more we traveled on the shortcut, the worse the road seemed to get. Suddenly, a car came roaring down the middle of the narrow road in the opposite direction. The other driver didn't stop. And now, Chris's car was hopelessly stuck. I tried to put the car in reverse and back up, but it just sat there and spun. There was nothing to do now but sit and wait. But how long would it take before someone came along to help? The car was already losing its heat, and soon it would be freezing inside. Chris decided to take action. I decided to get out, even though I was wearing sandals at the time and take a look to see how bad the car was stuck. Chris's mother was most concerned for the little children, and she said a quiet prayer. I prayed, Lord, send your angels to help us. We need help. <laughs> We're stuck in the middle of no place, and we need help. Mom, I think I see a barn over there, Mom. I'm going to go see if we can get some help. All right, be, just be careful. In spite of the snow and ice, Chris headed off towards a farm in the distance, hoping there might be a tractor or other equipment to help pull her car out of the drift. The lights inside the barn were warm and inviting, and so she stepped inside. I was immediately hit by a blast of warm air which fogged my glasses. I could hear voices, so I headed in that direction. I saw two young men playing around. They were throwing things at each other, laughing and joking. Um, excuse me. Hi. 
Hi. Can I help you? They were very polite to me. As a matter of fact, when they asked me if they could help me, I saw genuine concern when I explained my situation of having my mom and my two children out in the car in a snowbank. Next thing you know, there was a blue pickup truck waiting. For a moment, Chris wondered if she was making the right decision, getting into a truck with two strangers. But I thought of my children and my mom being stuck, and I slid in, and he slid in behind me. He took off fast, and we barreled down the road towards my car. At one point, I said, Do you want to drive your truck like this? It's not my truck. And as they headed toward her car, she became even more concerned. This is the car right here. Oh, okay, okay. When the driver reached Chris's car, he drove right past it as if it wasn't there. Why didn't they stop? Where were they taking her? Stay tuned for the exciting conclusion when It's a Miracle continues. In 1982, a severe snowstorm had blanketed northern Pennsylvania, and Chris Davidson, afraid for her grandmother, had bundled up her babies and, with her mother, had headed out to help. They took a shortcut to save time, but a speeding car forced them off the road into a snowbank. There was only one recourse, go off the edge. Either that or we would have hit them. Now they were stuck on a remote country road, and the temperature inside the car was dropping rapidly. Chris spotted a farm in the distance and hiked across the snow to find help. Inside the barn, she discovered a pair of farmhands who seemed only too eager to assist her. But now she wondered if getting into the car with them hadn't been one of the biggest mistakes of her life. Her mother, Elaine, shared her concern. Soon I see my daughter in an old blue truck, and she's sitting in the middle between two fellows and they're zooming up past me. We went past the car, dove off into a field, did a donut, spun around, came back on the main route, and then pulled up behind my car. Chris was still shaken, but her fears disappeared as the two young men went to work, hooking the car up to their truck and towing it out of the snowbank. I was very relieved that everything was okay, that we were able to get out of the ditch so easy. They peeked into my window after they were all done and they said, everything okay? And I said, yes. And I offered to pay them and they refused. Thank you so Thank much you. for saving us. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Chris and her family continued on to her grandmother's house, thankful for small miracles. I drove more cautious the rest of the way because of what had happened. And, uh, but we, we managed to get there with no problems. It wasn't until a few weeks later that Chris realized how miraculous her rescue had been. Once again, she and her mother were on their way to her grandmother's home. It's not until we'd had a thaw, and we thought, well, it's safe to take the shortcut this time for sure. We get close to the barn and I, I mentioned to mom, I said, I'd like to stop and thank them again. Chris approached the barn and peered inside. But this time, it was not warm and inviting, but a chilling experience. Instead of being a normal, well-kept barn, it was shabby, it was falling apart, it was empty. The roof and back was caving in, Tumbleweeds huddled against the broken walls of the stalls. My first thoughts when I saw this was, do I have the wrong barn? But I knew I didn't. I don't know, Mom. It looks like the same place, but it's totally different inside. There's a house over there. I'm going to go check out and see what they know what's going on. Okay, Chris approached the house, hoping that someone who lived there could shed light on the mystery. I was here a few weeks ago with my mother, and uh, there were some young men over at this barn that helped us. She said, this barn has not been working in years. Has not been used. 
nobody has worked in that barn for years. I was stunned when she said that. And I could almost hear the sound of the Twilight Zone playing in the background. Hi, can I help you? Hi, yes. Who were these farmhands who had cheerfully interrupted their work to help Chris? How could this old wreck of a barn have housed the clean and well-kept stables that they had so happily worked in? All my life I've listened to my mom tell me about how the angels will help you if you, if you ask. And the first thing that came out of her mouth when I told her what the girl across the road had said was, we must have had help. <laughs> oh. I think that God sends his angels when we can't help ourselves, when we have impossible situations that really call for uh, a helping hand, and they're there. For Chris, it was a lesson. I learned that uh, help is there if you ask for it. And I learned that uh, angels can drive pickup trucks. Stay with us for more amazing stories when It's a Miracle returns. As the popularity of the internet grows, we hear about couples who found each other and true love online. But the story you're about to see isn't just another love story. Oh, it's definitely a Valentine at heart, but it's also about a couple who met in cyberspace and discovered that they were a perfect match in more ways than one. Teresa Dravik is a native of York, Pennsylvania. For most of her life, she has suffered from serious heart and kidney problems that have kept her housebound. But in 1997, Teresa discovered the internet, and it was about to open up a whole new world for her. I was on there to make some friends and to have somebody to talk to. I wasn't looking for love on, uh, on the computer. That's not something that ever crossed my mind. Teresa wanted to learn more about life in foreign countries, and so one day, she signed on to a chat room that connected her with people using the web in Britain. Thousands of miles away, in Manchester, England, Ian Fleming discovered the same online site, and he and Teresa started a private chat. The next day, when I logged on, there was this message from the same man, and he had a bunch of questions for me. I sent an email to Teresa, and it said, I like doing my cycling and reading. What do you like doing? Because it was the first person I, I have ever spoken to on the computer, really. She kept it interesting, kept it fun and explained a lot about her life to me. The two strangers continued sending each other messages daily. And then we found out we had a lot in common and it just went from there uh, as far as chatting. And it was basically every time I come home from work and did my cycling and walked the dogs, I came in, I hope there's a message from Teresa. I honestly don't know at what point it went from a friendship to a romance. It happened and I was glad it happened. And this was about the time um, I was starting to get sick with a, a heart problem. Teresa's condition was serious, and she was immediately scheduled for emergency heart surgery. On the day of the operation, Ian called her at the hospital. Well, I told him what was going on, and of course he was very concerned, and I was very scared. You know, the idea of, of them doing surgery, where they were actually gonna stop my heart and open me up. You know, I was thinking, and I said, well, I've got time at work that I can take off. Do you want me to come over and visit you? You know, we could spend a couple of weeks together over the holidays. Wow. <laughs> I said, OK, if you're sure, I'd love to see you. And every time I heard his voice, it was almost like taking a painkiller. I felt so much better just talking to him. Teresa's operation was a success. And in December, she found herself at the airport, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the man she'd met on the internet just three months before. Teresa walked out into the middle of the crowd and gave me a big hug and my first kiss. And then she said, Welcome to America. <laughs> Honestly, from that moment on, I was hooked. This, this was the one for me. We just found ourselves connecting more and more and more on not just superficial subjects like favorite things, but on life issues. And 11 days later, Ian proposed. Because of Teresa's medical condition, they decided to live in the United States. 
But before Ian flew home to prepare for the move, they went shopping for an engagement ring. The ring that Teresa chose would have to be resized and would not be ready before Ian's scheduled flight. On January 6th, the young couple said their goodbyes. It would be several months before they would see each other again, and during that time, Teresa would become deathly ill. A tumor was discovered on her kidney. Her doctor, Michael J. Moritz, was extremely concerned. Teresa has a rather long uh, medical history as it relates to her kidney problems and uh, underwent her first uh, kidney transplant in the 1980s, which lasted for quite a while, but ultimately uh, did develop chronic rejection. The only option now was to remove both her kidneys. Ironically, the day that Teresa was scheduled for the operation was the same day that Ian returned to start their new life together. Hi. You look great. How are you? He had picked up the engagement ring before coming to the hospital, and he took this moment to slip it on the finger of the woman he loved, a woman who might not live much longer if she didn't find a kidney donor. Oh, it fits. First, just having him back again after um, four months, and then to have him put the ring on, and then knowing what I was going to go through the next day, it was a very, very emotional moment. You know, I've been thinking, I want to be tested as a donor. And, you know, I spoke to someone, and it's really hard on the donor. And I don't know if I want you to go through that pain. I'll be in pain for, what, a couple of months, maybe, right? At least it'll improve the quality of our lives. I didn't really think there was a chance he was going to match. I thought we'd go ahead, do the blood test, and that would be it. You know, they'd say, well, I'm sorry, but you're not a match, and that would be all there was, was to it. As you'd expect, uh, for, for any two unrelated human beings, the odds of being a perfect match, in quotes, perfect match in their tissue type, is one of three million. But miraculously, the tests came back positive. They had beaten the incredible odds. Ian was that one person in three million. On September 19, 1998, Teresa and Ian were married. Their dual surgeries were scheduled two months away. On the morning of November 10th, the newlyweds were being simultaneously prepped for transplant surgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And we had probably about five minutes where we saw each other. And then they wheeled me past Teresa and I grabbed all of Teresa's hand and said, Good luck. I'll see you on the other side. And that was it. That's the last thing I remember. I don't remember what time I woke up, but I woke up in intensive care. And the, the first question was, was how's, how's Ian? Their surgeries were a complete success. And Teresa and Ian returned to the hospital regularly for checkups. Well, Teresa, you're now two months after the transplant, and things are going very well. Your kidney function is normal. The likelihood of that kidney working a year from now is, is over 95 percent. The chance it'll be working 10 or 15 or 20 years from now is better than 50-50. Ian gave me more than just his kidney. He gave me my life back. He gave me self-confidence, courage, uh, self-respect, self-esteem. Teresa and Ian's love story became international news, and the hospital set up a web page for the couple to receive well wishes from around the world. There was about 200 messages on there saying, you know, good luck, I've been through the same situation, I've donated a kidney, I, you know, I'm on thick kidney dialysis, I know what you're going through. And I, I actually cried. You know, when we first started talking, not in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought this was going to be the result of, of that, that innocent chat. He just made me into a much, much stronger person than I was. He turned me took me back to the person that I was before I got sick. I really didn't believe in miracles. I, I always thought that there was explanations or to work the way around it. But now, from what I've seen and heard and what I've been through, yeah, there, there is such a thing as a miracle. We'll be right back when It's a Miracle continues. Coming up on It's a Miracle, a broken date leaves a young girl brokenhearted. But don't worry, he'll be calling back. 
17 years later. It's a story that will make you believe in the miracle of love. Then, a famous gospel singer fights for his life with only his family and his faith to hang on to. These stories and more when It's a Miracle continues. Valentine's Day is not the only holiday where a love story can occur, and the couple you're about to meet would agree. It seems that Memorial Day and Labor Day also played a big part in their on-again, off-again romance, and it was on one of these holidays that something phenomenal happened that would change their lives forever. Dana Herring and Dennis Dunbar first met in 1973 while attending high school in Los Angeles. At the time, they were just casual friends. After initially meeting Dana, I just felt that she, she had no interest in me, so I felt that it was just something that would not be worthwhile pursuing. Dennis was going out with another girlfriend of mine, and I was going out with another person, and it was just not convenient. But nine years later, Dennis and Dana met again at the wedding of mutual friends. And this time, the chemistry between them was different. I thought he looked pretty handsome in his tuxedo. There was an attraction that night at the wedding, and we talked for a long time. We had a good time, and, um, and we enjoyed each other's company. We just ended up pretty much staying together that whole night at the wedding, and that was it. Dana and Dennis began dating, and over the next few months, their romance blossomed. As it became more serious, they made plans to go away together for Memorial Day weekend. But before he picked her up for their getaway, Dennis stopped by the home of his newlywed friends. It was a decision that would change all his plans. This girl had come down from San Francisco, and they wanted to set me up with her. They knew that I was going out with Dana. They probably didn't realize how serious the relationship was at the time. I'll help you come up with a fantastic excuse. I'm so good at this stuff. You are? I can come up with just like that. I can try. Okay. I can try. And they talked me into, into breaking my date with Dana. Hello? Hey, Dana. Something came up. I can't make it this weekend. Well, what is it? Um. Just, just something. My reaction was yes, I was upset because we did have plans. And, you know, he called at the last minute to cancel. And I really was angry at the time. I just hung up on him and that was it. She didn't deserve that. And uh, I felt like an idiot. So um, I uh, never talked to Dana after that. Dennis ended up marrying his blind date. But after 10 years together, the marriage failed. And in 1997, Dennis was once again a bachelor. At that time, Dennis owned his own pest control business. And on Labor Day 1997, he was sitting in his office, calling clients to confirm appointments for the following day. Hi, this is Dennis Dunbar. There was one customer in particular that I called left a message that I'd be out tomorrow to take care of her account. Left my name and my phone number like I always do and uh, said if there's any problems, call me back. The next day I went out to, to service the account and for some weird reason the customer never got my message. But someone else had. Message one. Hi, this is Dennis Dunbar. I came home from out of town checked my messages and one of them struck me because it was from a man and he said, hello Terry, this is Dennis Dunbar calling from Dunbar Pest Control. If you have any problems or questions, please call me back. And I thought, well, the voice sounded very familiar. Hello, this is Dennis Dunbar. And that evening the phone rang and it turned out to be a, a girl. She asked if uh, this is Dennis Dunbar, who has a brother named Dan, which I do. And I said, this is Dana Herring. 
Dana, Harry? How are you? How'd you get my number? And she said, well, you called me. I did? Yes, you called and said something about uh, coming over to do a job tomorrow. And it hit me, wait a second. This other customer didn't get the message, so I got my customer's card. And I, I repeated the number. It would had a 960 prefix, at which point she said, funny. That's very close to mine. Mine is 906. He had transposed two numbers. <laughs> well, what a coincidence. And I was literally shaking. One of the first things she said after we chit-chatted a bit, she says, if I remember it right, didn't you stand me up? And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I said, I hope you're still not mad. And he said, you do remember what happened? And I said, yes, I do remember. I said, you broke a date with me, and you married her. <laughs> By the way, I'm divorced now. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks. But how about you? Did you ever get married? No, not me. So, so we talked a little bit longer, and I was just saying how weird this is. Thank you, And too. she said, well, if you'd like, maybe you could call me sometime, and maybe we could get together. Yeah, I'd love to. OK, great. I'll talk to you, Dennis. Bye. Bye. When he called me the next day at my office, which was maybe 10, between 10 and 11 in the morning, and my secretary said, Dennis Dunbar's on the phone. I was shocked. I was like, well, gosh, he's already calling? <laughs> We set a date for Friday night. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Dana. Something boring? Oh, how sweet. And he showed up with flowers. And we sat and we talked for about four hours when we were supposed to go to dinner. You'll never believe it. There were 10 of us, and we all met at this one fellow's house. I hadn't talked to somebody like the way that I talked to Dana for years. And it was just really, really, it felt good. We feel that we were brought together for a special reason. I enjoy spending time with you. It was completely different than any relationship that I had ever been in. Me too. It felt like it was meant to be. And 13 months later, Dana and Dennis became man and wife. I now pronounce you husband and wife. For them, their marriage is nothing less than a miracle. I think the miracle is how the whole thing happened, how he happened to transpose that one number and reaches me, of all people, out of 10 million people in Los Angeles. Timing was everything in this because the area codes had already changed out there. If I had dialed that number two months later, I don't think I ever would have ran across Dana again. I think I'm probably the most happiest I've ever been in my entire life right now. I am just glowing. It's heaven, and it's, you know, it's a person that I'm going to be with the rest of my life, and, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Besides the amazing luck of a wrong number bringing them together, Dennis and Dana's relationship may have also been written in the stars. On the day Dennis made his fateful call, his grandmother gave him a copy of his daily horoscope. It read, an old romance will heat up again. We'll be right back with more amazing stories after this. One of the most difficult tasks of being a doctor is to tell a patient that they don't have long to live. And one of the greatest joys of being a doctor is when the patient proves them wrong. And sometimes when this happens, it's because of a miracle. Please make welcome my brother, the wine ladies. I say God is gonna give me a crown. This way a crown. The Winans are one of America's first families of gospel. Their recordings and performances have won numerous awards, including several Grammys. But in February of 1997, they were praying for a much greater reward. They needed a miracle. Six months earlier, one of the brothers, Ronald Winans, had become seriously ill. 
Ronald had experienced an episode of chest pains, followed by recurring bouts of coughing and relentless fatigue. <coughs> His doctors treated him for pneumonia, but nothing seemed to help. Fellow gospel singer, minister, and good friend Donnie McClurkin recalls the time. We just figured that in, in a matter of time it would go away because nobody ever thinks death. We never think death. It's like you're sick for a moment, get over it, let's keep going. And consequently, we, we just forged ahead. Everything we were doing, full speed ahead. Months went by and Ronald only felt worse. And his doctors were unable to determine what was wrong. He and his family assumed that he just had a persistent virus. It became real problematic after a while because all of the treatments that they were giving him, they weren't helping. <coughs> and then it grew dramatically worse to the point where we would have to come and spend the night at his house because he was afraid to go to sleep because he felt like he was drowning every time he laid back. Ronald's brother, Marvin, had been on the road, but shortly after his return, he received a desperate phone call. When I found out he was as sick as he was, was one day he called me and he said he couldn't breathe. And so I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, you can't live long if you can't breathe. And uh, so I picked him up and took him to his doctor. I think it's just a virus. Could be the flu Ooh. or it could be other allergies. And so when the doctor came out, I asked him, I said, well, doc, um, when is he going to get better? And his answer really struck me as nonchalant, not really concerned. Um, well, I don't know. See, I told you I was OK. So when we got back in the car, he started coughing. The whole cycle started all over again. And I looked at him, and I said, I'm taking you to my doctor. OK, I'm taking you to my doctor. And he said, OK, that's when I knew he was sick, because he did not offer one ounce of resistance. And he was going to do like I said. So I knew he was sick then. Marvin took Ronald to the University of Michigan Hospital at Ann Arbor. There, they got a shockingly different response. Ron, what your pictures are showing me is that six months ago, when you started to feel badly, you had a massive heart attack. What? And what that did was weaken your aortic valve to the point where it's no longer functioning properly and your heart has become severely enlarged. And what we're going to have to do is go in and perform a bypass surgery, and we're going to have to do it now. Ronald just went into shock. And the reports just got progressively worse. I mean, it got to the point where when the doctor came back, he said he did not want to operate because it would, it would do no good. They were just amazed that he had lived this long. The entire Winans family gathered at the hospital. With their encouragement, the doctors finally agreed that although the chances of Ronald's survival were slim, they would go forward with the surgery. It was his only hope. Marvin. We know people around the world. And the first you? thing we do is when we ran into this situation was you called key people I got it on the air. around the world that you knew had faith. People in England, people in Germany, people in, in Japan, and you know, wherever you had folk that you knew knew how to pray. We yes. thank you for uh, healing, that healing belongs to Ron. The word went out on internationally televised religious programs, and soon, people from around the world were praying for Ron. In the name of Jesus. And for our friends and our loved ones, we bind a spirit of infirmity. Mom, I will lead us in a brief prayer. His friends and family gathered in the chapel as the long operation began. The surgery lasted 14 hours as doctors tried to repair the damage to Ronald's heart, but towards the end, it didn't go well. Suction. Plant. Plant. The doctor said, I don't know what happened. Everything went so smoothly. And then I was finishing up, and all of a sudden, his heart exploded. Ronald Winans was dead. For four minutes, his heart ceased to function, 
He felt himself slipping away, leaving his friends and family behind and heading toward a warm, white light. We know you're going to work a miracle. Inside the chapel, the Winans family continued their prayer vigil, unaware that Ronald had died. You've shown us that you are a miracle-working God. But the operating team wasn't giving up. They tried one last time to revive him. And suddenly, everyone's prayers were answered. Ron came back to life and began a startling recovery. All right, we got him. Good work, folks. No, and yes. we think he's going to be all right. Oh. I think the most encouraging thing was that there were people all over the United States and in various parts of the world that were praying. And they were all saying the same thing, Ron's gonna be okay. Once I came to, and they began to tell me what was happening, I couldn't believe I didn't have the activities of my limbs, I couldn't reach my hand, I, I, tubes were everywhere. I was like, what happened, you know? Every day was like a project to me. What tube is going to be removed today? <laughs> you know, and I had to fight. And I think that's where the battle is either won or lost in the mind. Thanks to the faith of his family and prayers from around the world, Ronald has made an amazing recovery and has returned to performing. This, beyond any shadow of a doubt, is one of the greatest miracles that I have ever seen in my 29 years of living as a Christian. Now I, I realize how connected we really all are. I tell you, I came out with a whole different perspective of how God wants us to love one another. Some people really went to bat for me, and I'll never forget them for that. We'll be back with more amazing stories right after this. I think most of us at one time or another have dreamed of meeting that perfect person, falling in love, getting married, and starting a family. Linda Shublack was no exception, only her love story is full of dreams answered, unexpected tragedies, and miracle after miracle. The miracle of true love was the last thing 39-year-old Linda Shublack expected to find when she moved to Sackett's Harbor, New York in the summer of 1993. I had just gone through a series of many losses in my life and I wanted to be alone and I wanted to reflect and get to know who I was as a person and as a spiritual being. So it was a good healing place for me. Linda prayed for guidance. And I got to the point where I was able to ask the Lord for a, a husband. It wasn't long before her prayers were answered. After I prayed, I sat and waited patiently and just listened and it came to me that God was going to send me a godly husband. His name would be David, and he would send him right to my door. And as if on cue, a determined-looking man came running up the street. And I look up, and here comes this handsome man with big brown eyes and big smile on his face. My name is David. David sat down to talk, and Linda knew immediately that there was something special about him. I could see his soul in his eyes, and there was a lot of depth and I was drawn right into them. Theirs was a match made in heaven. On their first date, they went to church together. Shortly afterward, David proposed. They were married a few months later in Arizona, where David had been posted to Fort Huachuca. After the night they celebrated their marriage, David got up early to go for his usual morning run. Linda was scheduled to attend a meeting of Red Cross volunteers that morning. And so she left David a note to find when he got home. That's when disaster struck. I heard sirens, and there were a lot of them. I could tell that there were several fire engines and ambulances. So I paused, and I prayed for the victim and the emergency medical teams. And then I went on to my uh, volunteer class. 
Linda didn't realize at the time that she was praying for her new husband, David. Running just after dawn, he'd been hit from behind at 55 miles per hour by a driver blinded by the sun. It would take a miracle for David to survive and regain a normal life again. Linda rushed to the hospital to find David in a coma. His legs were heavily bandaged, his arm was bandaged. They had him intubated and he looked like he was sleeping peacefully. Initially, the physicians told me that it wasn't that serious, that David would uh, be laid up for a while with some broken legs and a broken arm, but that everything would be okay and he would continue his career and we could continue our marriage. But the prognosis turned unfavorable as more detailed x-rays became available. Reflexes are present but weak. David's shattered arms and legs could be set, but his skull had been fractured in five places. Any one of those fractures should have been fatal. The doctor told me that David had suffered a severe closed head injury and the brain was swelling and that David was not expected to live more than a few hours. But the days wore on and David remained comatose. Physicians told Linda he was brain dead, but she refused to believe them. She knew from personal experience that miracles can happen, that prayers are heard. For four days, Linda kept a vigil by her husband's side as his condition deteriorated. And we think it's time to begin to think about his organs being used no. for the Ms. people. Shubak, you need to think how David can live on in others. No. The doctors now no, advised no. discontinuing life support and planning for the donation of David's organs. Army administrators began making arrangements to bury David at Arlington Cemetery. Even the Army chaplain urged Linda to let David go. I thanked the doctors for their information, and I told them that I knew that they were well-educated and very professional in their career, but that there was a person who was over their knowledge and understanding of the situation. He was God, and that God was going to take care of everything because God is a healer. The next day, Linda received the sign that she'd been praying for. I don't want to get your hopes up, but I just observed, I think, some kind of glimmer of movement. Now, now we got to run some tests. The doctor noticed that there was a primitive response in David's eyes. And so that caused a flurry of activity among the medical team, and they all got together. They were gonna go back in the room, and I slipped into the room before the team, and I leaned over to David, and I said, David, I want you to show them what God can really do. When they ask you to respond to a command, I want you to do it to the best of your ability. Okay, honey? As Linda stood back to let the doctors do their exam, a doctor asked David to lift his unbroken right arm. Almost defiantly, David raised the fingers on his left hand and then his entire left arm, the bones of which remained unset. For medical personnel, it was a revelation. They were shocked, happy, flabbergasted, said they'd never seen anything like it, and that maybe there's a God after all, and maybe miracles do happen. A magical meeting and an astonishing cure has convinced David and Linda that miracles do happen. Today, after two years of physical therapy, David is once again running. The lesson that's been learned that other people can learn is if there's something impossible, as many things in life are impossible, and it appears like nothing's gonna work, ask God. This experience has changed me where I am not afraid of anything or anyone, that I know what it means to stand and fight for what is mine and what's been given to me. I got a wake up that I never thought I'd get. It's made me realize God can do it if you ask it and expect it. We'll be right back. Tonight, you've seen some magical and inspirational events that changed people's lives forever. We hope these stories of hope and faith have brought a little peace and joy into your own life. So be with us next week, when we'll have more real stories of wonder on It's a Miracle. Good night.